Aloha, my Kako, everyone. Welcome to the Moana Nui podcast. My name is Moana, and I am the founder and host. And tonight, I am joined by my partner in crime, Dana. It's good to be back again, sis. How are you doing tonight? I am doing pretty good. Welcome to everybody that is tuning in live with tonight's special episode. We're so excited for you to be part of tonight's show. But of course, for those who may or may not know us, your first time tuning in, I'm Dana, the other half of the Moana Nui podcast. I am a voice actor, event planner, a photographer, and all the list goes on. <laughs> But then I'm not complete without the yin to my yang, the renaissance woman of this time, the cultural consultant on Lilo and Stitch. She's also a children's book author and the woman who has defied hands of time to be able to squeeze all this stuff. So, of course, I have to have her to introduce this beautiful other person that is to my right the beautiful the lovely moana dana mahalo she's hilarious so as you see on our show we like to have fun there's so much stress in life we gotta have fun too so but i just i wanted to welcome everybody this is this week we get to continue our celebration of manapahine month women's history month international women's day was last week I have the honor and privilege of working with a wonderful team of Manavahine, Dana, Latoya, uh, Pawahi, and Jazzy. And of course, my mom, my sister, my kupuna, all of that, all the Manavahines. But tonight, I'm really excited to, I know I say that every week, but I cannot help it. I get excited to talk with everybody because these are people that I respect and really enjoy bringing them onto the show to get to know more about them and their work and also share it with all of you. Sherry Daniels is our guest tonight, and she is the CEO of Papa Ola Lokahi, Manavahine of Papa Ola Lokahi. And I just, I really respect her, love the work that she is doing for our community. And really who she is as a Vahine, as a person. We met last year, like one year ago, I think, at a Women of Color conference. We never really meet. She was on stage, and I was like, hallelujah, we have a Native Hawaiian woman. And I'm like, now we really have some Hawaiians in these spaces. So I was like, okay, I got to reach out to her. She didn't know me, but you know what? I'm just going to put them out there. And we came together again at the uh, CNHA conference in Vegas. We talked story and here we are. She acknowledged the work that we were doing and invited us to become one of Papa Ola Nokahi's continental partners, which is something awesome yeah. that they're doing for our Kanaka community living on the continent or in the diaspora, even outside of the U.S. So I want to tell you guys a little bit about her. She's probably going to be like, my God, why is she reading my bio? But you need to know who she is. <laughs> so Sherry Daniel, she's been the CEO of Papa Olu no Kahi since 2016. She was born and raised on Maui. She is a doctor. Dr. Daniels is a graduate of Kamehameha Schools, no surprise. She holds a degree in the field of counseling psychology and has several licensed certifications. She has more than 25 years in social services programs across Hawaii in both nonprofit and government sectors. She was recognized in 2014 with the Maui County Women of Excellence Award. And she's also earned other awards, including Pacific Business Use, 40 under 40. That's right, we're under 40. She's actively involved in various community organizations on Maui, including Hawaiian language education, which is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, then beginning in early 2020, she shared co-leadership for the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Hawaii COVID-19 Response Recovery and Resilience Team, for which Papa Ololokahi serves as the backbone organization. She's really committed to the needs of our community, to helping mm -hmm. Kanaka to uplift us, to help navigate us through some of the systemic challenges that we face as Indigenous people living in an occupied space. And we're really excited to welcome her to the show. So, Ikomomai, welcome, Sherry. Oh, Valina Mai Kako, aloha. It's like, oh, which bio did you get? That's like circa 10,000. <laughs> I mean, a lot has happened, but I'm like, oh my gosh. But you never 
put out any of my dirty laundry. So that's all like PC stuff. So that's, thank you. Mahalo <laughs> for inviting me to this space. And I don't know, I, I'm excited, nervous. I don't know what the expectations are, but we give them. I'm super excited to be here and look forward to just the conversations and what you're going to ask me about. So. Yeah, definitely. We like to tell our guests that this is just think like we stay in a garage and we're just talking. Sorry, that's super formal on this podcast because if it was super formal, let's be realistic. Nobody like talk story on those kinds. So, no, if we stay in the garage, that means there should be food and there should be Kanikapila going on. There should be all this stuff. So I'm not sure who brings the music. I'm not sure who brought the food, but clearly I didn't get that. I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't, prov I wasn't provided plate with food on it but we go i'm okay with that i just want to say a lot to lisa and Kale who are in the chat welcome you guys uh, let us know if you guys have questions for sherry too we would have be happy to ask them for you we could moana wait moana i see it as we're talking i see the pop-ups of comments and i gotta say this because i will not ever live it down that i want to give a shout out to Kale koa who's saying I'm so cool. So Kalikua out there, mahalo. Mahalo piha for trusting your mama to be on this podcast. I'm going to assume it's my son. And since I'm going to shout out to him, I got a shout out to the other three because it would not be fair. So I do want to give a shout out to Apiki, Ohai, and Ili, who hopefully are listening in. But I also got to give a shout out to my staff and just all the other people, all the other wahine, and Connie, who's listening out there, who continually keep me grounded and keep me focused on what what I need to do, because I can get kind of squirrely and I can kind of go off on all kinds of tangents and, and all that. So, so yeah, I do want to give those shout outs to folks that really keep me focused and grounded in who I am. So, mahalo. Yes, I love that because that's what Dana and them do for me too. Same way, I can go on like, 50 million directions. They can like, hold on, Moana, we come back. She's going to bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So why don't we get start? So what we like to start with is the Pico, right? Tell us a little bit about where you're from. Yeah. <laughs> where <laughs> where you from? I'd like to give you my mo'okuauhau of, of 20 generations. If that's the case, <laughs> I, I got to apologize. I, 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 I know two or three generations because I had to know that for my when my children graduated or got from Kulakayapuni. So, but we're not going there. I think just for people to know who I am, I had the ultimate privilege of being born and raised on the island of Maui, Maui Akamalala Valu, and, and just being able to grow up there with my ohana. My mom was from, is from Maui, and my grandparents are from the area of Kowali in East Maui or in Hana side. And my grandmother's family was from Kapuna or Waihe'e side of the island. And so I think not really realizing how fortunate I was growing up on Maui and being in a community that everybody, right? You go in the grocery store and it wasn't when my mom would say, oh, we're going to go grocery shopping Ookas today. So anybody from Maui who know Ookas know, right? The little book. And I used to think, oh man, like really, that's like a whole day, like my whole day shot. Cause it's not like we're going in and go grocery shopping. We're going in and every two feet, you're going to stop because you need somebody, right? Somebody knows my mom is one of her classmates from St. Anthony or somebody my brother guys went to school with. It's, it, and so you're, it wasn't just grocery shopping. And I think as an adult, that was like the best, the best memories I had was being in those spaces because you really saw community. And re really when I was able to go to Kamehameha at Kapalama, I realized, holy moly, what world did I come to? Because Oahu is so different, right? That coming from a very s small town, you you don't realize how safe it is and how everybody's looking out for you. Cause you couldn't do anything without somebody saying, Hey, 
you're so and so's daughter, or, well, I know your grandmother, or you couldn't get around that. And I remember being in elementary thinking, oh man, everybody know everybody. That was, I didn't see that as a value to growing up in a small community or in that community until I was way older and really missing that. And I think being able to raise my children, I already, I always knew that I wanted to raise my family on Maui. Like I knew, I knew I wanted to go to college. I knew that was something I, I envisioned for myself. I knew that education was the pathway for opportunities. And don't ask me how I knew that or who embedded that in my head. I, I don't know. I just know that I went, my parents worked two, three jobs growing up. My siblings, my older brothers are nine and 10 years older. So when I was in elementary school, they were in graduating high school and things like that. But I went to a school that, that there wasn't a lot of kids that looked like me, right? I didn't go to a school that had a lot of Hawaiians. My community was primarily Filipino and Japanese. And so I think a lot of the Hawaiian students came from maybe not the positive areas. And so, but you know, when you're third grade, fourth grade, you don't see all of that. That's not important. But I, okay. So I knew I was a little different because I enjoyed learning. I enjoyed reading. I was, I wanted more of that. And I think in that space, I knew that education would be a ticket for me, but I didn't know how at that age, you just, you don't know. But I was the kind like, I want to go to summer school. And my parents were like, okay, great. Cause we don't want childcare, go grandma's house. And so that was really great. Right. I could do that. But I, but a pivotal point for me is that when I went to explorations at Kamehameha, I got off the bus and I thought, I am home. I knew right then and there, this is where I belong. I, and I never know how I was going to get there. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't, because at the time, nobody in my ohana went to Kamehameha. I mean, that was, that was privilege. And so I went back to school after that summer and I told my counselor, that's, I, I got to go. That's my calling. That's my people. That's, I just felt so I just knew, I knew it in my, I knew it in my, oh, I knew it in my, I just knew it in my body when I walked off that bus. And I tell that story because I think that's very indicative of who I am as a person, that it is about what my na'al is telling me that at fifth grade, I may not have the words to say, that's my kupuna, that's the, that's that ancestor kind of nudging. But now, very clear, that was very intentional in my journey. And so got to go to Kamehameha. I was also very lucky. That's where I met my Kane, who is from uh, Kauai. And so really, I know Moana Si. And so having that opportunity, but I knew that I wanted to stay in Hawaii for college. I knew that I could get just the, the opportunities. I, I think my philosophy was always that I knew I wanted to serve my community and being home was the best way to do it. And I wanted to live on Maui and raise my own family on Maui. Um, but I also knew that it didn't matter where I went to school, that, that for me, the education and the learning was all around, was always going to be there, that it didn't matter the school, that it mattered the person. Like I brought the willingness and the, and that wanting to build my own ike, right? That it, the school never mattered. Now, I'm not saying I'm not happy uh, that I went to Kamehameha and graduated. No, I am for, I am totally appreciative of everything that institution has provided. But I do believe that sometimes we put all of our eggs into a basket, hoping for like this magical result. That at the end of the day, as Kanaka or as a Wahine, that we have, we make choices on how and what we value and invest in. And I think I knew that I wanted to invest. I could invest in myself. And so 
Fast forward, we live on Maui. I have four wonderful keiki. I think one thing people don't know about me is we struggled, both my husband and I struggled in infertility. All of our kids are adopted. And so I had just the wonderful privilege of watching all of my babies be born. And they all have their own story. They all, I might also have, I had my own birthing experience with each of them. And so even though I didn't hanau them, I did. And I don't think I ever really recognized or realized how deep your love can be, especially when they're not from your own, from your keynote, that there is these other spaces that you can really feel that. So that for folks don't really know that about me, that when we talk about some of the challenges that Hawaiian wahine or ohana face, getting pregnant, having that is, is a reality. And not only for Native Hawaiians, for other communities as well. And it's often not something that's talked about. Um, it's a struggle. And so we have been very fortunate to have four of them. My oldest is 21 and the youngest is going to be 14. That being, an, being this makua or this parent, I don't see myself as an adoptive parent. I'm their mom. But I also recognize all of my kids knew, know who their birth moms are. They understand their birth story. They understand what got us to that point. And yet I'm, both my husband and I really believe that we weren't looking, we weren't searching. They found us in all of the cases. And so I think there's a sense of even more kuleana when you raise this person as a, as this parent, like you get a lot of kuleana that you, 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 it's not yours. Somebody entrusted you with this gift that you, there's no amount of money I could give these birth moms for what they gave us. And I think that's the, the part of our community, right? That's how we are, the, that things going come when the timing is right. And that they're the, the purpose attached to that and what all of that involves. So, and then I've been very fortunate to be able to do a range of jobs that I really enjoy and end up at Papa Ola Lokahi. Um, I think that's a little, a whole lot about me. I'm so sorry. Now the time is gone and now we cannot ask other questions, but. We can. What was the most difficult part of raising your keiki, whether health related or otherwise? Question, Kalikoa. Oh my gosh. I think you worry that you're doing it wrong, that a decision you make is going to make them upset and they'll never, they won't appreciate you or see you. And that's that the pressure of deciding things to help them be better people. I think that's the hardest part that, and being able to, you're not there to be their friend. I mean, right? Are you there to help? them understand their kuleana and their role and to be productive in their community. I had somebody ask me one time, oh, what do you want your kids to be when they grow up? And because I think sometimes people compare my husband and I and in, in our own accomplishments, that's where our kids should be. And I'm always like, you know what, if my kids want to go flip burgers at a fast food joint, happy days. Because if them doing that brings them joy, that they get up in the morning and they're like, yeah, they do their best and they're productive in their community, that's all I can ask for. I don't need them to achieve a bar that they think I've placed for them, right? Like I, I don't need them to reach a bar. I have my own bars that I put up for myself. And I just hope that I don't create that expectation or their belief that mom has an expectation that we got to be this high achiever. Now I do say I, college is a, education is a big thing. And that is something I, I think myself and my husband will not compromise on that you learn. Doesn't mean you have to go to a four year school. Sometimes other ways of learning is just as good trade schools or other things, but to not want to learn, that's not acceptable. Um, and so I, I think that's probably the hardest is not having them be achieved for me, 
but achieve for themselves. Like, they're probably like, yeah, you're not here at our house when she comes home or like cleaning day. Like she has some bar, like mom, look at food, no try at. I'm sure that when I all like, like text me later, mom, why are you, why are you acting up on the podcast? So, yeah, I mean, I think that's the other thing. People laugh because I think our kids are, have been raised in an environment that allows them to be their genuine self. And so sometimes my kids talk about things that I think some families are like, what the heck are you talking? Like, why would your daughter say that? And I'm like, why wouldn't she? And I'd rather know. I think that's just my philosophy. I'd rather know than not know because at least you can see it come. You know what? If you're going, if you're going to cock me on the head, come forward. Just come straight at me and hit me because then that gives me the choice on whether or not I can move or I'm going to let you hit me. When you come off on the side or throw me off, I really have no choice. I, I don't have a choice. And I think that's the thing for me is you got to give me a choice. When you don't give me choice, then that's not fair. You're not fighting fair. But if you have an issue, just roll up on me. Let me see you come walking towards me. So. I can definitely relate to that. I'm the same way. I'm like, just be straight, be upfront. Of course, yeah. not everybody's like that. And if you don't come for me, but it's like, you can do that. But just, just know that there's, it's, you're not going to get the best of me. It's what I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, but a lot of your story I can definitely resonate with. I was watching, I can't remember who did the interview. I think it was one you did maybe for University of Hawaii. But you also talked on there about how you were the first of your ohana to go to college. And I see that in the Native Hawaiian community, like where my mom too, she was the first of her family to go to college. So what, what did that look like for your ohana? I mean, you have siblings and like living in Hawaii. What sacrifices did your parents have to make to send you to college or did Kamehameha help provide any more resources for that? What did that look like? I, I think my, I knew growing up and I think I said this, right? My parents worked multiple jobs. My grandparents really, my grandma raised me. That's where I would walk to school, walk home. My brothers, they did not, they worked. I don't think. You know, they went to uh, UHMC or Maui Community College at the time. But I think for me, I wanted more. And so thank you, Kamehameha, where in, I think, our senior year, it was required that in one of the counseling classes, they pass out the UA application. And not to say I didn't apply to colleges on the continent. I did. But I think I also knew my parents couldn't afford it. And I didn't want to depend on them. I just didn't. And so I think for me, what I could accomplish and what I could do, I could do here at home. I mean, just the cost of education was such a difference. And I think I, I think in the back of my head too, I, I knew I didn't want to go too far. Like I wanted to be near my grandparents. And so I think that was a factor in my choice. I was very fortunate to be able to have Kamehameha, the scholarship program, paid for my, both my bachelor's and my master's. But, you know, you got to write, you got to write for them. You got to do your, all the, all the stuff, which is, I think, harder now. But back then, writing your essays and the pain, it's a pain. And I didn't ask my parents for help. Not because I don't think they would support me, but I don't think they knew how to support me. I mean, I think they pretty aware and I have two kids in college and I'm like oh my god this is a I struggle and I think I'm like I said pretty on top of it so I think back then I I just knew that wasn't a comfortable space for my parents they just didn't and I knew my parents worried about how they could support me and I wasn't about to put them in 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 more child I wasn't going to put them in a space of more debt and more this and more that like why would I do that that wasn't right and so I worked all kinds of jobs I I cleaned the bathrooms at Liberty House at Ala Moana I very quickly was a bag person at Foodland in Market City for those mm -hmm. of you from Oahu and but then I got a job on campus that's the gold mine right I realized oh my gosh I can get a job on campus I can do that and so I did and when I went to college, I had this very grandiose dream that I was going to be a doctor. I was going to be an, a gynecologist, an OBGYN and all of that stuff. And I 
that's what my pre-med was my major, that my plan, my, my grand plan of life was happening. And, and then I realized, and I say this all the time, I suck. I suck at math and science. That is not, them is not my friend. And I did, I failed organic chemistry. And my second time I didn't pass, I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? At the same time, I was in this program that helped marginalized communities, students who was looking to medicine to get some opportunity for some research, but also maybe even early admission. And so I had applied to that and I was assigned to the la a lab that tested, that tested medication on rats on campus. And if you don't know what's there, you just don't know. And I was amazed at the size of chickens and all the different animals that was there for, for research. And so my lab tested different antidepressants on, on mice and then using cats as some of that um, part. And so that was a very interesting experience. And so I think being not forced to, but choosing to make it and get this education was, I think, very important for who I became and just my own sense of accomplishment and pride and maybe some resiliency, right? Because it was hard. It wasn't easy. And, but I don't think I would change that at all because it gave me a really good opportunity to be like, yeah, I can do it. I don't mind working hard. I don't mind cleaning bathrooms. Like that, that doesn't define me. And I think it also made it very real for me that, man, if I cannot do some of these things, and my mom cleaned clean places as well as, a, as another job. And so and she was a janitor for the state. And I think I was always very proud that she could do that. And so I think for me, there was also a sense of feeling proud that, you know what, I, I, I don't need, I, I, I can, like, I can do these things and I can still be pretty awesome. Um, and so I think that's really important to recognize as well that, right, some of those life experiences, you can choose to have it drag you down or you can choose to have it really be part of your story and your narrative and really who you are as a person. So, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate that because I think maybe some of that life experience and work ethic is being lost on today's generation because we are enabled by technology and technology just makes things, a lot of things easier. And so maybe people get a little bit more complacent and don't have some of those hard knock, <laughs> hard yeah. knock life experiences. That helps to, to really prove to them, right, that you can overcome these challenges and that, like, life is not something that the carpet is laid out for you. This is part of character building and helping you prove to yourself that, like, you can get beyond those circumstances. And I think, I don't know how, how you feel, Sherry, but um, I know for me, in the, the challenges that I had to overcome... Like you, like I wouldn't change it. My sister asked me once, I know you had a very different experience from me being the oldest, right? Would you change any of it? You could go back. I'm like, no, because if I didn't experience those things, I wouldn't be where I am now. And in leadership, when you rise to leadership, you get knocked by stuff like every single day. So if you cannot handle it, you're not going to be a good leader, right? And you got to make some hard decisions. So... I definitely appreciate all of those things. And obviously the other women role models, women and men, role models who helped me to navigate those and people that I also looked up to as well. Yes. I think one of the, the things is I always get asked, who were your mentors and who did yeah. you look up to and all of that? And when I'm, when I've been asked that, I often pause because there really wasn't a lot of folks that looked like me that, right? I mean, I looked at my mom and my grandma and absolutely, right? Just that, just that essence of who they were. But when I look outside of that circle and I can see my mom's classmates, I can see all of these 
really the strong influence of wahine in my life. But nobody stood out. And then I think maybe that's not what it is, right? That it's not one mentor. It's a slew of them. It's mm -hmm. all of these aunties that collectively had influence, right? In different phases of my life, in different periods of my life, right? Or what is they say? They say season, reason, mm -hmm. lifetime. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I think those people had impact and influence on my life, both positive and negative, right? Both positive and negative. I think influence can be either way. Yeah. I don't think I intentionally okay. thought, you know what, when I'm 19 years old, yeah, I'm going to be running an organization. I'm going to be top dog. I'm going to be doing all this stuff. I'm going to be an influencer of my time. That was not even in my life plan right? That was not in my life plan. My life plan was I was going to college. And I'm going to say this because can not get pregnant in high school. Absolutely. Don't get pregnant in high school, graduate college, get married, buy a house, have kids. That was my life plan. My parents love my parents, but they're both state workers, right? And so when I got a job at the state out of, out of college, they were ecstatic, right? They felt, oh, we don't have to worry about you. You will be fine. And five years later, I'm like, I'm out. Like, I'm out seas. Like, this is not, like, I, it wasn't a fit for me. And I had a really good supervisor at the time who really, yeah, this, this is not a fit. Not knowing what that meant, but yeah. And so able to really learn how to be happy with these experiences. And so... Flat, fast forward 20 years later, I go back to the state. And at this time, my mom has already passed. And so my dad, he is thrilled. Yeah. He is, yes, that's what you, you see. Now, if you stayed, you would have had 20 years. You would have. And I'm like, yeah, but I wouldn't have been happy. Or I wouldn't have all these experiences that make me who I am. And then when I left the state to go to Papa Ololokahi, I think my poor dad, he was like, okay, I give up already. But. You know, I think he recognizes that I moved to my own beat of the drum and that the, that it's more about the experiences and being in a place. I think all of those things in life, all of the experiences, all of whatever you have helps put you in the place where you're supposed to do the, the most work and the best work. And. I used to hear people say, I love my job. I, I can't imagine being anywhere else. And I used to always think, yeah, I like my job, of course. But I can say now that there is this feeling of, I don't know if like, if even with all the ups and downs, I love my job. I have this passion for it. I think I'm pretty decent at it. But it, it fits me the best of all my career, all my, all my jobs that I've had along the way. This fits me the best. And I think that's really, that's really something to be said when you can say that about your job, is that it is the best fit ever, right? That I get to be in spaces and with people that, that help me grow, that allow me to help them grow that pushes my understanding of things um, that helps me better understand who I am as a person, but also what I contribute to our community. And it's those kinds of things, not easy, but yeah, I can really say I enjoy, thoroughly enjoy my job. Definitely. Definitely yes. Now, Sherry, with you being as the CEO of Papa Ola Lohakaki, could you describe the mission and goals of the organization and what led you to take on this leadership role? Okay, so Papa Ola Lohakaki is, we are, our mission, our kuleana is to uplift Native Hawaiians the health of Native Hawaiians to its highest possible level. And we get that language straight out of our Native Hawaiian Healthcare Improvement Act. 
which is one of three codified federal laws. And so what folks don't know is there's three real main that is on federal books. There's one for housing, which is our Department of Hawaiian Homelands and that act. There's also an education act as well as the health act, which POL in that legislation is the oversight administrator of Native Hawaiian health for Native Hawaiians in Hawaii, but also across the country. So our responsibility, our kuleana, is really how can we uplift health for our people? And if we recognize health, not just in today's terms, but when we look across our history, health is not this singular idea. Health isn't just about my body. That health encompasses all of these aspects and more, and it also includes the moon, the stars, the ocean, the winds, the, all of that, what we put into our bodies in the foods that we eat, what we think in our minds in terms of our mental health, how we, you know, keep the balance in our lives, whether it's when we have conflict with family, whether all of that, and also that we have housing, that we have education, that we have these other opportunities that influence and or come into our life. Those are all health. But I think we spent so many decades, so many years looking at health from a very singular lens of it has to be physical. And so for Papa, we look at often the legislation was created really based on the Aola Mau study. So if people online go Google Aola Mau, it was a study that in 1985, Dr. Kekuni Blaisdell, amazing, but he was a medically trained Western physician. Um, but he also, if you read about him, really was just its renaissance around the issues related to self-determination. And so really how you integrate who you are as a Kanaka, as a Native Hawaiian or as a Hawaiian or a Kanaka or whatever you resonate with in I, of that. He really looked at that integration between what it meant to be healthy as a Kanaka, but also what did it mean to be Kanaka and how, and having that self-determination and sovereignty and what, and how they interplayed. Dr. Kikuni Blaisdell. Yeah. Google him. He's amazing. And so that's really POL's, that's our people. Right. When we talk about our mo'okuoha, we got to start with that. But also some of the earlier reports that talked about the health of, of our people. And so in 1988, the report comes out. And by 1992, through a lot of just work by folks like Dr. Kikuni Blaisdell, like a lot of folks like Auntie Claire Hughes, who's a nutritionist, a Native Hawaiian nutritionist, who used to write in the OHA column. And just a lot of others. There's a lot of people that contributed to Eola Mau. And in 1992, Senator Daniel Inouye helped push for the creation of the Native Hawaiian Health Care Act. And then it changed to the Native Hawaiian Health Care Improvement Act when it was reauthorized. But that really, when you read that document, it talks about the kuleana or what our tasks are to uplift the health. And so, yes, at the time, diabetes and other chronic conditions were very prevalent, still is, but we're talking high blood pressure, um, cardiovascular, all of those things. But when you look at Eola Mau, you also are looking at things like nutrition, dental. I often have people say, why aren't nutrition and dental kind of in one chapter? If you cannot eat, if, you're, if your oral health is not well, you're not going to be able to have the nutrition. They go hand in hand. And we know that now, right? But when you look at the original report, you see a lot of our disparities and you see recommendations. And so a few years ago, we actually revisited Eola Mau and did um, Eola Mau Amal, which is the second generation of Eola Mau. We found that a lot of the health issues and challenges were still present. We also recognized during that time that the impact of colonization, the impact of systemic racism, all of historical trauma, generational trauma, all of those real buzzwords were realities for many of our people, of our ohana. 
I don't know if people could use those words as readily or as comfortable and not really knowing what that meant. But when you talk about those layers of eha, of trauma, and Hawaiians never had a word for trauma when you look back um, in, in the Vakahikoi. And so, but when we look at those layers and layers of unresolved eha, they're going to come out some way, somehow. And for our community, it comes out in a lot of our health disparities. And so when we look at what the things Papa Ololo Kahi does, it is generational work that we continue to have to do. And so we're very mindful that um, the work we do is not um, glamorous or fun. It's hard. It's arduous. But what makes it... Um, what makes us do what we do is because we know that matters to our people, that we have an opportunity to help our community heal. We have an opportunity to help our kupuna stand in as the ike that they hold, that they have value, that our ohana are more resilient than what we see on paper. And so I think those kinds of things make a difference in the work that POL does. We get funded through Congress every year, and the funds that we get are used to fund five of our Native Hawaiian healthcare systems that's located in Hawaii, and that's part of the legislation. And then POL also funds different initiatives on the continent, especially as we see more of our people moving or growing on the continent. We're looking at how, that, that, how does that work? How do we continue to stay connected? Because we recognize the real big difference for our community is the connection to culture. Culture is the key in a lot of things, right? You take away culture, whether it's language, whether it's our values and belief, we don't have a people. And so if we're looking at how we uplift, the first part is to really recognize where our connections lie and what does it mean to be connected to who you are in your community and in your culture. And I think sometimes we're in this space and time where I think we, it's easier to say, I am Hawaiian, or I am Kanaka, like there's pride in that, there's value in that. But there was a time, right? We know this, that many of our kupuna did not have that uplifting feeling of, yeah, you are Kanaka. Yes, your Ike and your beliefs and your values are what matters. And so I think it's also reestablishing, reigniting what that means. And so that's just some of the, I think the way we think at, at Papo, that it is our privilege to be able to be in this space and create opportunities for our community to thrive. Uh, and I'm going to be the first to admit, it's not always perfect and it's not always maybe what people hope for or expect or want. And I think that's par for course. But again, I'm not looking necessarily for perfection. I'm looking for understanding on how we can do our job better and how we can uplift the the greater lahui in the work that we do. And And we do that on really supporting our community and our community partners. I, we're really strong believers that it's not me, it's not my staff, it's not us that create resiliency, that communities already have it. Our, our role is to provide opportunities and hopefully resources that allow them to demonstrate their resiliency and their abilities, and then to network them with others right? So that they can grow their own purpose. And so it's always like a makavai, right? An awai coming down. For us at POL, we really have an opportunity to be the source, to push the water down so that it can fill into our partners, which are like the lo'i. And that our partners are the ones who caretake that lo'i, cleaning it, keeping it so that the weeds don't block the water coming in, that everybody's putting their hand in the work. That, but if we look at that, that, that model of thinking, we all need each other at the different levels. And that part of our responsibility too is to understand 
those that are in the lo'i, what does it mean? What does that mud feel in your toes? What does it mean when you're pulling that huli and you get to see what, what has grown and that you can feed your community, right? But then, because then that, for me, I got to recognize up at the top, I got to keep all of that clean. And we got to make sure we have the resources to keep the water flowing, right? So those are some of, I think, the, the thinking we have at POL is that it is truly the collective we. But, you know, I like using the, the visual of a potluck, right? We all bring something to the potluck. My husband would probably say, just bring bag chips or the forks. That's what he would tell my kids. Sign up for the napkins. But, right, but if we all brought chips, that wouldn't be. But when we bring all the things that we cultivated, that we made, that we put together, and we bring it to the potluck, look how much more rich and robust that is, right? And then when we're like, oh, Auntie, no worry. You know what? You was busy last night. We bring extra mea eye for you, right? That as a community, we're coming together as well. And we're helping to bridge that and, and create those spaces. And I think that's pretty awesome to be able to do. And, ha and again, have the privilege of doing that. Like not a lot of people, not a lot of people have that opportunity to, to create and to watch communities thrive, not just survive, not just exist, but truly thrive. Now, there are times that is going to fluctuate. Sometimes people are going to struggle and they're just holding on and surviving. And then it sometimes it's even worse where just thinking about existing is a challenge. So it's also coming to communities and coming to our partners where they're at because they're the experts. Our role, my role especially, is to be the translator to advocate for and to better understand those needs of our communities, not only in the Pai Aina, but a, a, across the continent. Because if I cannot, if I do not understand where our community is at, where their struggle is, and, and I'm not just saying access to health, that's important but where they are in their own push positionality of who they are as a Hawaiian, as a Kanaka, as a Wahine, as a Opio, then I can't, I, then I don't do my job to the best of my ability. And, and I think that's really important. That matters to me. That is more than just kuleana, right? And so that's really, I think, when we think of PO, that's the passion and that's what I bring to the table that I, that is always at the forefront. It's always like right there. And, and what would our kupuna say? What would our kupuna expect? And it's not a burden. It's you do this for a greater purpose than yourself. And so, yeah, that I think is POL in a nutshell. Mahalo, that is so beautiful. And I, I love that you use the awai and the lo'i because that is it's such a nice tie into our culture and our, our worldview and the holistic approach that you take, that it's not just the kino, right? It's all of the things that make us Hawaiian. Because I got to admit, like when you first said, reach out to me, I was like, Sherry, I don't know what the heck I bring to health. Like, I'm not, <laughs> not my background. Like, uh, I know what dafta, I know what business, <laughs> like any of those things. But when you explain it like that, I was like, Oh, yeah, yeah, I can help. Because it's, it is really about what it means to be Kanaka. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. I, I am definitely on about helping other Kanaka embrace their culture mm -hmm. and reignite, like, the value that our kupuna have, that our culture has. Because uh, it often gets overshadowed, right, in this Western society that we live in. And as we know, so many people exploit our culture for... And I wonder too, and, and I do believe that sometimes we put our own layer of, right, we're not Hawaiian enough, mm. or somebody else puts that layer on us. I mean, I, I don't know mm -hmm. who's listening in, but if we really think about how many of us have thought that, I'm not Kanaka enough, I'm not Hawaiian enough, I don't olelo well enough, I don't practice my culture, I know Ken Hula, I don't... And so... Eh, eh, I'm going to say this on my own self. I don't know how many people ask me, do you do hula? And I'm like, 
it, it took me a long time to be comfortable in saying, actually, no, I did take hula growing up, but yeah. it's very uncomfortable to be the tallest, fairer skin person in the back row that you did. Your parent can see you from down the mall that, you know, and, and you just don't feel comfortable. I never felt hula like now I have Kumuhula friends would be like, no, that's, and, and I watch my daughters dance and I'm just like, oh my God, beautiful, right? I wish I could do that. I wish I could play ukulele. I wish I could just sing, right? I could pick up a ukulele and sing a Kane Kapilas. I, that is not me either. Right. I am the worst at memorizing Oli. I can Olelo some. I took Olelo in high school. My kids are Kayapuni, but I am the first to admit I, I am so uncomfortable, not for lack of my own issue of feeling not kanaka enough. And I recognize for me, my brain moves faster than my mouth. And so I struggle with that. And so, but that's something I've had to come to an understanding about that. You know what? I may not be this amazing hula dancer, singer, slash oli, slash olelo guru. But at the end of the day, my heart beats fit, my na'ao beats very strong for our people. And that to me is way more valuable than anything else that I could do. And it gives me an opportunity to uplift others who are amazing at doing oli, who can pull it just like you're talking to the gods themselves, right? To kiakua themselves. And so I get opportunity to create space for others to step up and to showcase them. Um, and so that, but it's hard. It's hard when you have people say, you lead a native wine organization and you don't only, you don't make lay. And I'm like, oh yeah, not my strong suit. If you like your, your lay pole stay on your head, I am probably not the one to do it. But I'm great at sewing. Like I can kui lay, that's fine. I can do that. So. I think that's part of leadership too, right? Is knowing your, what you contribute and what yeah. you step back and let others have the, have that space to highlight. And that doesn't make you less of a Hawaiian at all. I think it actually strengthens your, who you are as a Hawaiian, because you recognize, I mean, that's part of being Hawaiian is recognizing your space, your positionality, what you can contribute and what you can. And that's the thing is to be honest about what you bring and no judgments, right? truly no judgments. And that to me is a very kana. That, right? That the other thing we tell our kids a lot or my husband does is, hey, when you go someplace, you don't need to ask. You shouldn't ask, hey, how am I going to help you? How You just step in and you do. And I think that's part of Kanaka leadership too, that even if you're not good at it, just go, just step in, just help, just put your hands to it, just do the hana. And, and, and I think that's something that all of our generations need to understand and be aware about. Not just the next generation, but all of the generations, because we all come, we all come with layers of stuff. We all come with layers of stuff. So yeah, I think that's yeah. really something to think about as a leader in whatever community you're from. Definitely. That's a great advice. Yeah. We're coming to the end, but one last question from Kale Koa. Oh my what's gosh. Your, <laughs> what's your biggest fear when it comes to your profession? I think my biggest fear is that I'm not doing enough for our people, that the work that we do continues to be pushed back on, that we continue to believe that we have to behave and do a certain way in order to elevate ourselves, that all the work around self-determination, about choice, about knowing who you are as a person and as a Hawaiian, that isn't 
that isn't heard, that we have Kanaka who don't feel that they are Kanaka enough. I think that's my biggest fear, that nobody should feel that they're not Kanaka enough. That whatever space you're in, that, you know what? Your kupuna put you there for a reason. And I think to have people feel connected again, like maybe my biggest fear is people not feeling connected. Connected to whatever that means for them. Connected to ohana, connected to beliefs, connected to values, connected to the elements, whatever that is. And I think that's my biggest fear is that we don't encourage being connected as a kanaka and being okay to say that. And not say that because it's cool to be kanaka or, oh, it's going to, I'm going to check a box and I'm going to do all this. That no, that when you know and you have this understanding and you're, you, you can recognize your place and who you are, that you need to say, you need to speak, you need to use your leo and your voice to say it's no longer about me having a seat at the table. That it is now about, I want my mana'o, my words, my actions to have value, to have meaning, to have value in what gets carried on. And so I, I think that's my fear that we don't embrace opportunities when they're in front of us because we're too afraid to act. And I think Lilio Kalani has, has a saying about um, not acting for fear of, right, of failure, I guess, basically, mm -hmm. that you cannot have that. There's enough of us in our Lahui, both those with Koko, but those who are just as committed to our Lahui, even without that, that they're there to help us continue to be uplifted. And I think that's what we got to remember. Yeah, I, I agree with that for sure. Good question, Kalikwa, good question. So just like that, the hour is gone. <laughs> so I think we talked a little bit about like what it means to be Hawaiian, feeling Hawaiian enough. And so maybe we can continue that into our next conversation and we can explore the, the health of ODP. I don't know if people want me to come back. I mean, they might be all like signing off. See ya. But I, I think having people learn who I am and have that opportunity to see, get a peek into my life, I think helps, I think, blend into the next conversation about some of the more, I guess, tougher questions. Because then, right, people have a better understanding of, oh, that's where she's coming from. Yeah. So I'm more than happy to join you folks again on another broadcast um, if you guys will have me. And hopefully people joining in will circle back and join in, but also really join Moana's, Moana's podcast more frequently because I think there are some topics that are just kind of kind of interesting, kind of pushing boundaries, kind of those things, but safe space and opportunity to really have conversation. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, definitely. And to that point, if you watch our podcast and there's things that you would like us to discuss, we're always open to that too. Moana Nui podcast at gmail.com or you can leave comments on the thread where we read all of those. We welcome the engagement. We want more. So yes, because we want to really talk about the issues and the topics or Maybe the things that people don't want to talk about in the open themselves, but would like to hear other perspectives on it. Like we not shame to do that. So we really want to normalize these conversations so that people feel more comfortable. Because I think a lot of it, especially in our, what kind of started in our mental health series was talking about topics that we know people are grappling with, but it's not easy to be vulnerable with people that you don't really trust, right? For us, we wanted to have it in these spaces so that you can see, no, you're not the only one. Maybe you don't want to come on and be a guest, but you can listen to people talk through it and help you a little bit. And maybe it'll be enough for you to go and seek whatever help looks like for you, whether it's talking to family, talking to a friend, going to seek professional help, going to see a counselor if you're at school, like whatever that is for whatever stage of life you're at. 
finding yes. somebody that you can be in safe space with is really what we want to have for people because that's super important to your mental health and just being a human like being a person yes yeah. so yeah mahalo nui yes so with that said mahalo to sherry mahalo to papa ololokahi for feeding us being our ally and helping us to do this work for our community um and to keep this going so yeah. mahalo everybody until we meet again take care everybody have a great rest of the week Ahoy ho. Ahoy ho.